Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations in this country, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live, and to meet on this territory. My name is Maggie Fairs, and on behalf of Business and Arts, I want to thank you all for joining us. Today, we are very pleased to have the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage, Julie Jabruzan, joining us to discuss details of Phase 2 of the government's emergency relief fund and what this means for Canada's art sector. This session is part of the Arts Response Series, which Business and Arts launched back in March. And our goal with this series is to keep the art sector informed and up to date. We've recorded each of these sessions and you can find them all on our website. We're recording today's session and we'll have that up in a couple of days. I do encourage you to take a look. For today's session, we are very happy to be partnering with the Canadian Arts Coalition, Mass Culture, and Global Public Affairs. And with that, I'd like to introduce Charles Smith from the Canadian Arts Coalition to share a brief overview of their work. Charles, over to you. Thank you, Maggie, and welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, as Maggie indicated, my name is Charles Smith. I am um, the Executive Director of Cultural Pluralism Arts Movement Ontario, and also a steering committee member of the Canadian Arts Coalition. For those who don't know, the coalition is a collaborative nonpartisan movement spearheaded by a group of artists and arts administrators, mostly from national art service organizations. We work together to address some of the policy issues that are impacting the arts and culture in this day. Principally, we're focused on federal um, relationships and advocacy, trying to raise issues that we think would improve the arts ecology, promoting the arts that are across our communities and also engaging with our publics. My role this afternoon is to ask a couple of questions, but before that, um, to introduce to you Tara Mazurk and Sean Casey of Global Public Affairs. Sean and Tara. Thank you, Charles. Uh, pleasure to uh, see everyone virtually yet again. Uh, for, of course, those who haven't seen my colleague and I in what seems like an endless number of Zoom calls over the past few months, my name is Sean Casey. Joining me was my colleague, Tara Mazurk. Uh, we're both from Global Public Affairs. We have the pleasure of working with both Business for the Arts and the Canadian Arts Coalition and a significant number of other national arts service organizations to help to navigate the emergency support networks at the provincial and federal levels for COVID-19 pandemic-related programs. Looking back to when things shut down in mid-March, there were a number of questions on how arts and culture in this country would survive during these bleak times. If I told you back then that we would have programs that would support uh, supplementary wages for employees, provide monthly direct support allowances directly to artists, interest-free loans, rent relief packages, and a half billion dollar investment into the Canadian Heritage and Canada Council for the Arts programs, followed by additional supports for non-program recipients. I don't think there are many on this call who would not have taken that. And arts organizations, of course, and individuals across the country have been adapting, planning, and ensuring they are meeting public health protocols for the safety of Canadians. We all want to mitigate the risks around future health and economic damage. Arts production, programming, and the impact on the cultural workforce have been hit hard. So for many, there's a long road to recovery. Yet we must take some time to celebrate the dialogue that has occurred as a result of this pandemic. Black Lives Matter, and renewed action on anti-racism and inclusion. On multiple arts service organization and group calls, Sean and I get to hear what organizations are doing, how they are adapting, and how they are innovating. Arts organizations ask questions of their peers. The learning environment, support for each other, our respective organizations, and sector policies are stronger as a result. As we move from summer to fall, the government is moving from relief measures into recovery planning. Our team at Global Public Affairs will be working with Business for the Arts and the Canadian Arts Coalition to reach arts and culture communities so that you can contribute to federal policy planning discussions. With the recent release of Phase 2 in emergency support funding for culture, heritage, and sports organizations, and in order to discuss where the government has gone and where they are going, we are pleased to welcome the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Member of Parliament for Toronto Danforth, Julie DeBrusen. Julie has been listening to cultural stakeholders on an ongoing basis and helping adapt many government programs to meet the needs of our sector. Please welcome Julie for a presentation from Canadian Heritage, which will be followed by a question and answer period of pre-submitted questions. Welcome, Julie. 
Thank you, and uh, thank you for including me in this conversation. Um, je vais parler pour le plus part en anglais, en anglais mais s'il y a des gens qui, qui veulent parler en français aussi, uh, je suis toujours contente à parler aussi en français. Um, I, I, I kind of liked, we, we passed our trajectory right before we, we started this meeting. We talked a little bit about um, where we were about four months ago when we started our conversations and really trying to, to mark what would be the next steps uh, after we, we were all sharing in, in a really devastating shutdown uh, of, of our industries as we tried to face into this pandemic. And so the, the previous time that I had a chance to talk with everyone in a meeting like this, we were talking about phase one funding. And uh, I'd like to be able to give a, a good little update on that. Uh, as of June 29th, almost 75% of those funds were allocated. So that's, that's a good sign that, you know, phase one has, has gone out. Uh, and today I'm happy to be back to talk about phase two and any ongoing work that we're doing. I, I want to highlight, you know, when we heard Tara and Sean talking about the importance of feedback and, and hearing from you as to how these programs develop, it is absolutely true. I have seen all of these programs develop, be it that even with um, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, it, you know, taking into account that royalties would not count towards the $1,000 for eligibility, um, to even I saw that we have some community museums that signed on. How did we make sure that community museums were also able to apply for funding? All, all of the different components really came from the feedback we were getting from, from meetings like this and, and from conversations we've been having. And I know we can talk a little bit more about that as we go ahead. Um, I also want to highlight that you have me here, you're seeing my face, but there's in fact a whole team. That, that's supporting you from different kitchen tables, couches, all the different places that we're locating our computers at the moment. So on the call today, we have Irene from the minister's office. We have Kathy from the department. They're also taking notes and, and checking to see, you know, what, what you're saying and how we can respond. So know that you have a whole team that's kind of wrapping around on these issues. Um, before I go too much more into phase two, I also wanted to mention that existing programs, the non-emergency programs, continue to, to work. So, for example, you know, I've seen programs going to support museums, cultural spaces funding, festival funding, different kinds of the usual things that you would expect to see as, as heritage programs are continuing. The emergency funding is over and above. And there's been a real effort uh, that I have seen to, to try and accommodate the fact that things aren't happening the way they might. You're, the festival, if you're running a festival, might not be running the way it would have run in the past. Uh, but making sure that, that accommodations can be made. So it's always worth really reaching out uh, if you have funding through one of the regular streams to say, okay, you know, things have changed. How, how can we, we make this work? Out. Um, now, I'm really excited about phase two because phase one was really focused on existing recipients uh, of heritage funding, funding through Canada Council and the like. Uh, and the reason for that was really to try and get funding out as quickly as possible as part of phase one. So, and, and as you can see from by June 29th, 75% had already been allocated kind of shows that that worked to get that initial bunch out. But the exciting part was that phase two gets to go a little bit deeper. And that's where it starts to go to people, uh, to organizations, people who weren't existing recipients. And, and that is really important to some of the other issues that we're going to be talking about today, particularly on how do we reach out to a greater diversity of groups. So there are things that are part of the phase two, such as reaching out for smaller independent broadcasters. That includes community television. Um, one part that was exciting to me because I'm missing my music festivals this summer is uh, support for the live music industry. 
So for example, that specific emergency funding is open until July 29th through Factor and Music Action. And it covers venues, artist managers, booking agents, concert promoters, for-profit music festivals. So really something that, that kind of tries to wrap around all of the infrastructure as well around the live music industry. Um, there's funding that has gone towards arts training as part of phase two, movie theaters, publishing through the book fund, uh, recorded music with uh, support for recording studios, um, Canadian owned labels, music video producers, uh, and support for indigenous radio and television. So really a, a much deeper breadth in phase two from the usual perhaps recipients and and we can talk certainly a bit more about that as we go along so the total emergency funds it was mentioned right at the outset by sean was 500 million but in addition to that we also have to think about all the other parts that also can help to support uh, arts industry um, so for example uh, the canada emergency response benefit for the individuals but also the wage subsidy uh, which was expanded fairly recently to, to also support arts training and has now is being extended till the end of December. Uh, the rent subsidy, the business, uh, the business account. So there are other parts that also can be available in addition to the $500 million. So now the focus is also on recovery, uh, where where we're seeing some parts of our country are opening up. And, and this is where your feedback really counts because I hope you will have seen that up to now, all of the feedback that we get from these conversations does feed into the programs and how we deliver them. So this is the next phase where we're continuing to reach out and, and please like give us your feedback as to where you see the needs, how, you think that we can help partner with organizations to make sure that uh, we get through the other side of this pandemic together. So, thank you. And thank you, Chris, for bearing through with me through all of that. Hi, everyone. Um, we're back. Thank you very much, um, Julie. Um, we're going to start with some of the questions. And I have um, the first two. Um, so with the coalition, we were very pleased to see the components of phase two funding um, as it addressed a number of concerns that we were, our, our members had brought to our attention, um, a survey that we conducted in June. And particularly, we were very happy to see um, about the funding um, that addressed the precarity of indigenous and racialized and other marginalized artists and the need to look at increased digitization across the arts sector, particularly within those communities. However, you know, some of the current criteria for federal funding still leaves out a number of community-based organizations. Some of them may be indigenous, racialized, some of them community-based. And so we're wondering what avenues or options exist for those organizations that do not already meet the requirements for core or project funding from Canada Council or Canadian Heritage. Um, that that's a good question and and i appreciate that um because it kind of points to the how how do we continue to expand and and to provide that further depth of support and i think it's really important that we do that um i just wasn't sure if you don't mind if i ask so when you're referring to community-based organizations are you talking as well are you talking about professional organizations as well or or more amateur um, we prefer to use the term community-based, which could be a mix. It could be, or it could be professional or amateur. Okay. No, no, that helps. Thanks. So um, there are a few different places that uh, we can look as we go. There's more flexibility really in, in programs. If you look at the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Use, um, her, the, her portfolio. So for example, the building communities through arts and heritage is one fund. That, that can help to support more community-based organizations. Uh, and so it's worth looking to those types of programs as well. Uh, she has the Anti-Racism Action Program as part of her portfolio and uh, the Community Support Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Initiatives Program. 
So there are different programs as well within, within her portfolio that can complement, taking into account, especially when you're talking about you know, the need to include in a, in, in a stronger way Indigenous and racialized artists, that that's something that we need to continue working on as well. Thank you. Um, second one that I have is the, um, the federal government has led the way with emergency funding and the sector is particularly grateful for the government's willingness to amend and extend the CERB and um, the wage subsidy programs, but we're concerned about the longer term. Uh, what is the government's view on significant new federal investment for longer term support for arts and culture? What can we learn from what has been done in other countries? So for example, in the UK, you may know about the funds that are coming through and the same within Germany. What about here? Um, well, uh, that's a good question. We were talking about how now really we're, we're looking to recovery. How, how do we yeah. go into the next phase? And, and you can even see it in the approach phase one, which went to the existing recipients was really about trying to get money up very quickly. Phase two, go deeper. And, and even if you just saw you know, this week, we're extending the wage subsidy until the end of December. It, it's all part of, of the puzzle as we work through on recovery. And that's something that we're working on right now. So all of the feedback that you're providing, all of these conversations feed into that process because we recognize that you know, arts, particularly live arts uh, productions, we're among the first to shut down might be, we were talking about you know, how people can feel nervous still about being in crowds. Uh, they'll be among the, the last to reopen as far as getting together in large groups again and filling a theater. So there's a recognition of that. There's a recognition absolutely of the importance of supporting the arts and culture industry and wanting to make sure it's strong. And, and so we're working, like I said, to exist, some of the existing programs have been extended and we're continuing to work on it. So all ideas about how we can we can continue to help and work together is, is good. I, I will flag one thing, which is programs from other countries aren't easily necessarily transferable to, to Canada. They just, they come from a different base and how they calculate the amounts can be different. So for example, some countries I've noticed, I think I saw it when I was looking at Australia, they were including their wage subsidy, their general wage subsidy um, as part of their arts package. So it just, it's not necessarily apples to apples. I think the real focus though is in each case, what, what do we need? What do we see the needs? And it's going to be different community to community you know, across our country. And how do we respond to that? Thank you. I'll turn it over to Maggie. There we go. Great. So next question is, there have been notable discussions regarding federal interprovincial territorial plans throughout, throughout this pandemic. Can you speak to any of the discussions around relief support, reopening and recovery for arts and culture? Um, if I'd say there's one thing that I have found uh, the most impressive as we've gone through this, it's the fact that we've really been able to work with the provinces and territories and across you know partisan lines anything like that it's been really a team approach as far as how to get through this pandemic and how to respond that that's how it should be it's really nice to see that it's how it happened uh, just for me that's something that that i've found when i've been participating in telephone calls to to see that kind of of partnership and so Minister Gilbo and myself have have talked with provincial and territorial ministerial colleagues about heritage, arts and culture, and, and the responses uh, due to the pandemic. I know that the minister himself has had regular calls with provincial and territorial ministers of culture, and there's one coming up. I was just looking for the date here. Looks like July 28th is going to be the next one that they're going to be a meeting again. Uh, I've also had the chance to talk with representatives from different municipalities too. To, to get perspective of what's happening. And, and when we're talking about community organizations, they often see that in a much more direct way as well. So those have been really helpful conversations to have. Uh, and it's really, these meetings are about exchanging information, 
if different different provinces and territories are at different stages. So it's a little bit of a chance to learn from one another too, as we see how it's working in different provinces and how they're reacting and, and trying to, to coordinate where possible, where our ideas, you know, what are the best practices as we go forward. So we're, we're continuing to work through it with the provinces and territories, but it's, it's been very regular meetings and it's a real, real good example uh, of, how things can work when people actually are all focused on trying to get through the same problem. Charles, I think you're going to ask the next question. Yes, uh, apparently. Um, so you spoke already <laughs> about, <laughs> hello again, you spoke already <laughs> about the um, support um, uh, in both recovery and in terms of indigenous or racialized. I guess the question we're looking at here is how is the minister's office working to ensure that the recovery plan and longer term investments lead to an inclusive arts ecology that fully engages with indigenous, racialized, marginalized, and community based organizations. Yeah. Um, and that, that is something that, that truly I was focused on even, even before this pandemic, although it's hard to really picture that time at this point. But over, since I've been parliamentary secretary, it's something that I've seen the team working on, which is how do we how do we increase the stakeholder groups that we that we talk to and who give us their opinions and their advice and their insights? Because that's structurally, if I would think, one of the most important ways to make sure that policies are able to actually respond to the needs of different communities is to in fact involve those communities um, so be it different you know you refer to indigenous communities racialized marginalized community-based organizations how do we reach out and make sure that they have more direct input into how these programs will look and that's something that i can say you might not see the immediate impacts it takes a little bit of time but i absolutely see that happening with people reaching out to try and get more of that advice and that I think that's going to be the basis for much more inclusive policy, a policy that actually responds to those needs more. Thank you. I pass it on now to um, Maggie again. I'm waiting to see Maggie. I know. Here we go. Hold on. Apologies, technical difficulties, just one though, so that's good. Okay, next Thanks. question. Um, do you think a whole ecology review could be useful to ensure that all Canadians have access to arts participation, not only arts professionals, uh, sorry, not only professional artists and consumers of arts products, but participation at all levels from community-based and grassroots organizations to larger institutional contexts? Yeah, you know, it's one of the things that um, is striking is that arts and participating in arts means so much to Canadians as a whole. That's something that's really shared. Uh, you know, I don't know, I have a stat that 95% of Canadians believe that arts and cultural activities and a community make it a better place to live. I know that I've seen similar types of stats from the Toronto Arts Foundation when they've done their surveys. Uh, and so it's really a chance to harness that support. And when we look at the pandemic and how we've all gotten through this, this time of you know, physical separation, uh, really arts and culture have been key to, to keeping people engaged. And, and so it's a chance to kind of harness that support and to say, okay, how can we bring all of that together? So one of the things I was talking about before was how do we reach out to more groups? To, to get their input. Uh, but when we're looking at a whole ecology and reviewing everything, I think it's also trying to have, when we're talking with different organizations and groups, also talking about all of the different programs across governments as well. So for example, right now, I, I really like to keep highlighting for people, there's a black infrastructure fund that's open right now. I think it's open for another week for black led organizations that support black communities. And it's, it's not art specific as, an, as a fund, but it's something that can be used by arts funds 
Um, there's social enterprise funding um, kind of programs as well through uh, other departments. So how do we look at and make available and known to people as well the, the diversity of different types of programs so that, that it's, not, um, it's not as difficult to track down? Because I think that's part of it too. There, there's a whole lot of great programming out there, great things. Not, not all great, like there's more to do, but there's a whole lot. How do we make sure people know that that's what's available? Okay, who has me so next? Much. I know, Tara, sorry, I'm, I think Sean has you next. We're <laughs> passing the baton along. <laughs> I do, over me. It's going from Toronto back over to Ottawa now. Mm -hmm. um, we miss you here, Julie, and uh, hopefully uh, once things uh, get back to normal in September, we'll see you back here in the nation's capital. But I've got a couple of questions. The first one being, uh, phase two funds seem largely geared towards connecting funds with organizations. Are there any plans for emergency funds that can be accessed by individual artists? Yeah, uh, and, and that's come up. And that was really um, where the emergency response benefit was such an important part of the response just out of the gates. And, and again, you know, what I mentioned about uh, the feedback that we heard from artists about excluding royalties from the initial $1,000 um, that you can receive over and above the, the emergency response benefit. That was really important feedback and shows how things can kind of get tweaked as we go along. So the emergency response benefit was extended by eight weeks, um, knowing that there are many contract workers like artists who aren't going to be able to get that to their jobs in this short to medium term that we're in right now. Uh, we've also extended the wage subsidy, or we're in the process of doing that today, <laughs> to the end of December. So that's also to try and, and support job creation and, and people being able to keep their jobs. Know that through the, the phase one and phase two funding, there are also um, attestations when, when organizations are signing on that they will try and make sure that funds can get to freelance workers as well. Uh, so there, there are those pieces that are taken into account. And there is a lot more that we were going to be working on right now as we talk about the next phase for recovery. But, but we're cognizant of the fact that freelance workers are a large part of the arts industry. Excellent. Um, with the, the shift to many projects now going online, how do you suggest that we reach low income people who do not have access to equipment and internet? Uh, what can the Government of Canada and your colleagues at the provincial level do to ensure access for low-income students and adults? And that, that's been perhaps one of the, the most interesting but also shocking things about this pandemic in the way that, you know, it, it kind of gave us this huge pause and it really, um, lack of a better word, identified or show, showed everyone where there are gaps, such as access to internet. Like that was a really big one because as schools moved online, arts moved online in all of these different ways, uh, that's not an option for everybody. And, and that perhaps was driven home the, the most clearly as we entered into the lockdown uh, back in March. So there are two strains to this, if I could say. The first one is the rural con connectivity piece. And I know that I saw as we were getting all of the people on the chat joining in, we have some people from rural communities and it is in Minister Miriam Monsef's uh, mandate letter to be actually increasing access and to connect remote areas. So the aim is to connect 95% of Canadians by 2026 and 100% of Canadians by 2030 to high-speed internet. Uh, and that's really, I'm, on that one, I'm talking about the more rural component and extending the infrastructure. The other question though is, economic access. Um, and so you could be in a city like Toronto and we have the infrastructure, but not everyone can access it. And on that one, there was a program that started, it's a five year program that started in the last parliament, it was our work, which was to increase access, affordable access to internet. Uh, it was a $10 a month program. Uh, and the goal was to reach 220,000 households across Canada. I was just double checking to make sure I had that number right. 
I know that in Toronto, which is my reference point to see how programs roll out, um, it was going through co-ops in Toronto community housing. But that's a starting point. I think that as we see the challenges faced when we have to all try and move online, we we actually need to do more. But it's it's something that at least there are some some pieces that are already in in play. Okay. Now over to my colleague Tara. All yours. What an experience, eh? <laughs> Again, Julie. Um, so this question is related to a type of matching fund. So for the rules under the endowment incentives component of the Canada Cultural Investment Fund, most of the funds donations are restricted and have to be held in the fund and only the interest used. In this time of emergency, how is Canadian Heritage reviewing programs like the endowment incentives to ensure organizations can make the best use of this funding? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, matching funds, particularly in a time like now, is something that a lot of organizations really count on to be able to, to leverage for, for more donations. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, we're committed to encourage and support private sector investments in eHearts and to continue that. But as you've pointed out, it's something that, you know, as we look through it, the whole Minister Gibo's team, the, the minister's office has been looking at this issue that you raised. Um, and with, as you've seen with other programs, we have seen other programs have their requirements, their eligibility requirements relaxed to take into account that we're in different times. Um, and so we're, we're open to a similar approach, but we're still really looking at what the options are right now. Okay, thank you. It's encouraging to hear that Canadian Heritage is reviewing the programs in light of COVID-19 impacts. Uh, the last question that we have from our pre-submitted questions is, how is Canadian Heritage approaching support for cultural infrastructure projects, both to ongoing and pre-pandemic capital projects, and for infrastructure, equipment, and retrofitting costs related to COVID-19 reopening and recovery? Yeah. And, and it's funny, somebody was telling me, uh, it, was, it was an article, I think, I'm trying to remember if it was in the Globe or the Toronto Star this weekend about the architecture, um, architecture of the pandemic and, and how different, diff you know, how acoustics are even different if you remove, you know, say three quarters of the audience. Just all of those pieces, I hadn't really even thought about the acoustic side and how do you manage different different experiences as people look at how we're going to have to reconfigure at least for a little while so um the cultural spaces fund or yeah, canada cultural spaces fund is is still the main fund that is continuing to contribute to physical conditions for arts and heritage um spaces and that's something that i've seen as i've been kind of doing my work is to see that it's continuing there is continuing conversations with people as to ongoing projects to get a sense of how it's impacted, if there are increased timelines, increased costs as to how the, how the work is happening. Uh, most of what we're hearing is what kinds of special specialized equipment might be needed to, to support safe reopening of spaces. So that might require, I saw somebody was referring uh, to plexiglass or those types of things. Um, I know that I've also heard from people from businesses across the board, not just arts organizations, about access to PPE uh, and, and how, how to cover those kinds of expenses. So uh, main thing is if you currently have cultural spaces fund that is being applied to a project and the project conditions have changed, you should get in touch with the minister's office to get that information out. Um, and they're working on trying to prioritize projects, shorten some of the wait times as we go through with that. Um, and then as well, you should be looking for what, what will be project funding as a whole. I think this might end up being a bit of a whole of government approach as we go forward as to how do we help to support businesses as they go through this. And I would say that, you know, arts and cultures organizations as well. 
Thank you so much. Um, I know with such a large group of people on the call, there's some big, there's some questions coming through the chat and in the Q and A. Um, and I just want to note that we aren't taking live questions um, because of the volume of people on the call. But I know that Irene from the minister's office and Kathy uh, Bolin from the department are both tracking everything that is being said in the chat, being uh, said in the Q and A, um, to to work towards um, what will what the discussions will be. Over, over the summer and into the fall. And of course, Business for the Arts, Global Public Affairs and the Coalition um, will be looking to host more of these where, where we can track some of the concerns. Um, and Julie, I think you would agree with this that uh, if there's anything on particular programs that you have questions about, to reach out to the program officer, reach out to the minister's office uh, because the dialogue certainly does not end here. And, and, and I really want to highlight that because in this time, and it is a very unusual and different time, um, I've seen in a really heightened way how people's comments, feedbacks, pointing out the gaps, highlighting what the needs are, has really been taken into account. And, and so all of the questions, and, and I'm happy you kind of highlighted Irene and Kathy are on this as well. It, people, we're, we're looking at all of this. We're looking at all of the questions. We're taking the feedback and we are working hard to see how we can make sure that the programs are responsive. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Robert Foster, Chair of Business for the Arts, uh, for some closing remarks. Robert, you're muted. You got to start over again. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Good. Uh, so, Julie, first of all, thank you for taking the time to join us and have a conversation today. Uh, I know you're someone who has uh, been passionate and involved in issues of income inequality, and it's been part of your perspective from the beginning. Uh, I assume with two daughters, you do care about women's issues uh, and you're focused on those and those matter to us. And from your comments today, it's clear that you are focused on BIPOC issues uh, and, and the matters that are very much thrust in front of us uh, as, as a community. The uh, creative arts community as an industry is a $54 billion a sector with uh, 600, according to Statistics Canada, 666,500 employees. So we really do matter to the Canadian economy. Your support uh, and your colleagues support is extraordinarily important to us. We are very aware of the time and energy being put in by you and your minister as leaders in all of this. And we greatly thank you for caring about us and for showing the leadership uh, that you are doing. Um, it's a, a pleasure for a business uh, for the arts, of which I have the pleasure of serving as chair, uh, and the Canadian Arts Coalition, Mass Culture, and our friends at Global Public Affairs to team up and uh, show that we can circle the wagons and work together on, uh, on issues that are very important for all of us. So on behalf of, of all the sponsors today, thank you so much for joining us.